I have the privilege to introduce the three distinguished guests we have here. Um, first, uh, Hal Brands, who is the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at John Hopkins Sice. Um, he's the author of four books, most recently Making the Unicolor Moment. Um, he'll be talking about George W. Bush, and it's an additional honor because he's also my predecessor at Yale. Um, I'm still in the program now, and, and Hal was mentioned there too. <laughs> it's forthcoming, forthcoming. <laughs> and um, next, <laughs> next to Dr. Brands is Paul Miller, who is the Associate Director of the Clemens Center here at UT. Um, he is also the uh, author of a few books, most recently, um, American Power and Liberal Order, which really is the other essential book on conservative internationalism. Um, and he'll be speaking uh, more broadly about conservative internationalism into the future. And uh, directly to my left is Dr. Yonet Pekusko, who is the postdoctoral fellow here at the Clemens Center. Um, in the fall, he'll be joining Texas State University as an assistant professor of political science, and he'll be talking about the Trump administration. Um, the order is a little different than what you see here. So first, um, Hal will speak, and then Yonet, and then Paul. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Cynthia. And thanks very much to, uh, to Charlie and the Clemens Center folks for programming. It's been a fantastic conference uh, and a great set of discussions. So. Uh, not, not by any sort of design whatsoever. I'm actually talking about uh, where, where the other brands left off. So, uh, particularly with the joke about Bush revisionism, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what uh, an emerging Bush revisionism might look like, uh, to be provocative as much as anything else. But I'll say a few words about conservative internationalism first, uh, given that that is the theme of the conference. So. Uh, Personally speaking, I'm a little bit torn when it comes to the idea of conservative internationalism. I, I think it's incredibly useful to try to break out of the realism, liberalism, constructivism debate, and I think there are some uh, very important insights in the concept. And uh, I'm not at all bothered by the idea of creating new categories and, and trying to impose some sort of coherence on the past. In fact, as somebody who studies grand strategy, that's what I do for a living. Uh, but I think there are also a handful of aspects of, of the concept that leave me a little bit ambivalent about whether it is in fact a category in which we should try to fit people, whether that's George W. Bush, who, who I would have to talk about, uh, or others. And, and those, uh, sort of the concerns I, I guess I have, have to do with some of the, the pillars of the concept that they've been put forward by uh, Henry in his policy review article and in his book and, and others as well. And uh, I'll just mention um, a, a couple of these things, uh, as much for, for fodder for discussion as anything else. Uh, so if, if you look at kind of the 11 pillars of conservative internationalism that uh, were laid out in, in Henry's Policy Review article, which I think really kind of introduced the concept, uh, one of them has to do with the idea that conservative internationalists don't necessarily expect that economic freedom will lead to political freedom, at least not automatically. Um, my ears kind of perked up when I read that because I, the, the interesting thing is that it's actually contradictory to what well, Reagan, who's often held out as an exemplar of conservative nationalism, tended to believe. So during the Reagan years, you know, as Tony Smith and others have written, Reagan and George Shultz firmly believed, for instance, that Chinese economic liberalization would eventually lead to political liberalization. And so, so it may be a case where the description of CI as a school and, and sort of the, the historical record don't entirely match up. I think there's also some potential for uh, slipperiness when we think about the way that these various schools of thought relate to international institutions. And, and perhaps it's just a definitional question about what an international institution is. Um, but I think you know, every post-war president that we've had who, who is sometimes identified as a conservative internationalism, so a, a conservative internationalist, sorry, so Truman or Reagan or any others, has actually placed extraordinary emphasis on institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, NATO, uh, U.S. alliances, uh, certainly. Uh, and even the most supposedly unilateral presidents that we've had, people like George W. Bush, have relied heavily on the U.N. in a variety of contexts. And so uh, it, perhaps the, the, the conservative internationalist argument is that these folks don't rely on sort of the more stereotypical international community international organizations, the UN, the, the universal membership organizations as the primary guarantors of US security, but but that kind of strikes me as a false distinction because I don't I can't think of a single president who actually has uh, had that reliance. Uh, and then that, this just gets me to the third, I guess, question I would raise about <coughs> conservative international 
nationalism as a category, which is that I sometimes get the sense that it, it may be based on, um, and it, it, it's a response to an exaggerated version of liberal internationalism. And so uh, if you look at uh, ideas about the role of force, um, it'll sometimes be before the liberal internationalists don't really recognize the role of force in international affairs, but in fact, every U.S. president of the post-war era, including you know, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, even Jimmy Carter, uh, recognized the utility of force, or at least threatening to use force. And, and so just to go back to an example that was discussed this morning, yes, Barack Obama absolutely sought to avoid the use of force vis-a-vis -vis Iran, be practiced, uh, albeit in sort of a backward way, uh, coercive diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Syria in 2013, and he spent the first three years of his presidency surging additional naval and aerial air force units into the Gulf in order to create credible military options vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And so, so I guess what, perhaps the distinction I'm trying to raise here is that uh, conservative internationalism often seems like it is a critique of liberal internationalism as it has sometimes been expressed by John Eikenberry rather than liberal internationalism as it's been practiced uh, by U.S. policymakers. And so, uh, as a result of all this, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of trying to determine how well somebody like uh, George W. Bush fits into the category. Uh, and I think if you just kind of take the standard conservative internationalist checklist, uh, it's clear that he fits the category in some ways and in others that he does. So he, he was clearly concerned uh, both with the balance of power and the expansion of freedom. Uh, so that checks a couple of the boxes. But the countries where he ex expended the greatest effort to promote democracy, so Iraq and in particular Afghanistan, uh, were not at the center of the international system. Uh, he certainly understood the role of force in accompanying diplomacy and expanding freedom, but I don't think that he believed that culture constrained democracy, which is, as I understand it, another pillar uh, of the paradigm. So I, I could go on, but I, th I think the basic idea is that he fits the bill in some ways, and in some ways he doesn't. So, um, you know, we could go on at some length about this, but, but in the balance of my time, I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. So I'm going to talk about a different question with respect to Bush's foreign policy, the question of how that foreign policy is going to be seen over time, whether it will continue to be viewed uh, in such a harshly negative light, or whether uh, perhaps the views of his foreign policy will ameliorate uh, over time. Uh, and I think that's a potentially interesting subject uh, just on the merits. I think it's also potentially interesting for a conference on conservatives in the world. And so uh, I bring this up. This is a particularly uh, particular hobby horse of mine these days because I've just written a paper with a co-author, uh, Peter Fever, where uh, we point out that there are very good reasons for the sharply negative views of Bush's foreign policy that have prevailed to date. Uh, most of which have to do, of course, with the Iraq War, uh, the global war on terror, and the negative consequences uh, that flowed from those conflicts. And I think these are the issues that have really colored the assessments of a lot of uh, early assessments of Bush. Uh, in fact, there was a poll of historians that was taken just around the time he left office where 98.2% of historians thought that he had been a failure, and 60% believed that he was the worst president in U.S. history. Uh, and if you read uh, Jan Edward Smith's recent biography, Will, Will, I think you blurbed that one, right? Uh, you can see that this, this interpretation is, is alive and well. So uh, what we argue in the paper, though, is that in the coming years, perhaps over the next decade or two, there, there's likely to be a sort of Bush revisionism that will emerge over time. Uh, much as we have had Truman revisionism, Eisenhower revisionism, you know, even Nixon and Johnson revisionism. And this is in part because uh, views of U.S. presidents almost always improve over time, um, even ones who are very unpopular when they left office, like LBJ. Uh, but it's also in part because there are at least uh, some decent reasons to think that the harshest judgments of Bush's presidency are overstated. And so uh, what we do in the paper, and we'll just very briefly outline here, are what we think are the six most plausible lines of Bush revisionism. Uh, and, and in the paper, we don't necessarily endorse each of these lines of revisionism. The idea is to kind of lie lay out what they are and then say what the arguments for and against them are. And I, I think that uh, people, reasonable people can, can differ in terms of where they think the balance lies. I mean, Peter and I certainly differ on this, and I, I still think that the bad outweighs the good. But, but the argument here is that there are intellectually serious versions of Bush revisionism that are likely to emerge. And I think good historians will have to grapple with them in, in assessing the record of somebody who, for better or worse, was one of the most consequential conservative foreign policy leaders of, of past generations. And so the six arguments, just in brief, are, uh, number one, the empathy defense. So the idea that uh, certain decisions that Bush made after 9-11 may not have turned out very well, but they were at least intellectually defensible given the information 
uh, and the options the administration had at the time and given the pressures that it faced. And so uh, the light footprint approach to Afghanistan after 9-11 actually made some sense given the, the constraints the administration faced with respect to other military options. Uh, more controversially, uh, we make the case the decision to invade Iraq was in itself at least defensible in light of the fact that the containment policy was eroding, that Saddam uh, posed a continuing threat to U.S. security interests in the Gulf, uh, the long-standing ties between Saddam and, and an array of terrorist groups and its suspected WMD ambitions, uh, and then just most, most pressingly the fact that 9-11 had showed the dangers of leaving threats to fester uh, in the end box. So that's, that's one potential defense that Bush's foreign policy. Uh, a second is what we call the he kept us safe argument. So basically, uh, that it was actually quite, if you had told people in early 2002 that the United States would go another seven years, it would complete Bush's term without another mass casualty terrorist attack on the U.S. homeland, that would have been quite, seemed like quite a, a shaky limb to walk out on. But in fact, that is what happened, and there is at least a, a plausible case to be made that some of the Bush administration's uh, pretty aggressive counterterrorism policies, so everything from expanded intelligence authorities to, to the aggressive military pursuit of terrorist groups to the financial war against terrorist groups, had at least something to do with that. Uh, the third argument is the he got a rock right eventually part. And so uh, the idea being here that, that although the first uh, three and a half years of the Iraq occupation were a disaster, uh, the Bush administration actually got a handle on the conflict from 2007 through about early 2009, and it handed off to its successor an Iraq that by uh, virtually every metric was actually on a pretty good trajectory politically and, and militarily. Uh, and in particular, this line of argument points out that, that Bush himself should get a lot of credit for refusing to withdraw from Iraq in 2006, when most uh, of the critics argue that he should do that, uh, including me, by the way, uh, and instead he, he was really the decisive factor in crafting the surge policy and bringing his administration and Congress along with that policy. Uh, the fourth argument is what we call the wor a world beyond Iraq. So the idea here being that, uh, yes, Iraq dominated Bush's presidency, but if you look at the administration's conduct in the rest of the world, there were some real achievements, a partial list of which would include the opening to India, uh, handling relations with China and Japan fairly well, beginning what we now think of as the pivot to Asia, which included updating a number of U.S. alliances in the region, uh, PEPFAR, uh, the Anti-AIDS Initiative in Africa, which by, uh, I think, even the most conservative estimations, and Josh can probably correct me here, saved uh, over a million lives uh, and others. Uh, the fifth line of argument is uh, the tale of two presidencies. And so the idea here is that the quality of Bush's policies improved significantly over time. During the first term, uh, there were severe failures of policy on Iraq and other issues, uh, which in many cases were driven by severe deficiencies of process. During the second term, uh, Bush got a more uh, congenial, uh, a more systematic NSC process in place, and the result was the improvement of policy on Iraq, uh, the improvement of policy on India, and a array of other issues. And then the final argument is that uh, it's what we call, it's, it's all relative. So the idea, uh, Presidential revisionism almost always emerges as a response to the struggles of that president's successors. Right? So uh, people thought Eisenhower was a dope when he left office. Once they saw the way that JFK and LBJ got the United States into Vietnam, they thought maybe this guy isn't so bad after all. Uh, without stretching that parallel too far, uh, I think we can say that the Obama years are going to give us greater sympathy for Bush. And the argument is not necessarily that Obama did better or worse than Bush in foreign policy, uh, but it's undeniable that Obama did struggle on a range of issues from Syria to Iraq to Afghanistan to Russia to the South China Sea. Uh, and what this reminds us is just how difficult foreign policy is in general, uh, how mistakes and missteps and disappointments are inevitable, uh, at least to some degree in international affairs. And, and, and frankly, if you carry the chronology further forward, and here I'm drawing on, on Will Ferrell, uh, and you include Trump in the com comparison, Bush is actually going to look pretty good. Uh, but with, through the contrast. So uh, we acknowledge in the paper, um, and, and I want to stress this very strongly, that none of these arguments are entirely persuasive, um, and there are reasonable counter-arguments to all of them. So yes, uh, Bush eventually got a rock right. That was only after three and a half years of getting it catastrophically wrong. Uh, yes, Bush had some successes outside of Iraq, but he struggled massively on non-Iraq issues uh, like Iran or North Korea, which looms particularly large today. Uh, yeah, Bush got better at process and handling some issues in the second term, but there were also some policy initiatives 
that were going quite badly awry when he left office, like the war in Afghanistan. Uh, I could go on and on and on. You can make many of the same counterarguments about counterterrorism and other issues. And so the paper itself isn't necessarily what I would, I would think of as a, a hard argument for Bush revisionism. Uh, but it is making the argument that we need to take the idea of Bush revisionism seriously. Uh, because there are defensible intellectual grounds in which to argue uh, that his foreign policy was not as bad as the initial judgment of history made it, made it seem. And this, this debate, I think, is going to be interesting in its own right, but it's also potentially interesting in terms of the themes of this conference. Because for better or worse, Bush was one of the most consequential foreign policy presidents in recent American history. Uh, in a lot of ways, his presidency really revolutionized our understanding of what conservative foreign policy was. He was a conservative president, after all, but uh, certainly in the, the early days of his presidency, sort of the 2001 to 2003 period, he was as likely to draw support from liberal hawks uh, as from anyone else. And, and aspects of his foreign policy uh, were, in fact, deeply troubling to the older school conservative realists of people like uh, Prince Kokrov. Uh, and certainly Bush's presidency has cast a shadow over subsequent political debates on, on foreign policy, both within the Republican Party uh, and more broadly. You can see this in 2008, you can see this in 2012, you can see it in 2016. And so I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, I think what this means is that for us as scholars and historians, this all places a very high premium on getting the story of Bush's presidency right, uh, particularly as the archival documentation starts to emerge over the next decade or so. And doing that doesn't necessarily mean embracing Bush revisionism. I don't think I would embrace Bush revisionism myself. But I think it does mean taking seriously the, the possibility that Bush's record uh, was more complex than we initially thought. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Cindy. <coughs> My paper is called The Trump Administration and the Future of Conservative Foreign Policy. And uh, in political science, we usually begin by announcing our methodological approach or analytical approach to an article. And uh, for this one, the approach is called wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thesis is that much like the quip about Richard Wagner's music, I think that there is a chance the administration's foreign policy might be better than it sounds. <laughs> there are two reasons for that. One has to do with the process, another has to do with the substance. I'm going to be brief on the process and then move more towards the substance, which is the, the theme of this conference. But on the process, I, I think that Trump's approach, such as it is so far, resembles in a way an emergent strategy approach from the business literature which I studied extensively for my upcoming book and this approach could lead to successful outcomes in foreign policy even in the absence of a more traditional grand strategy and uh, basically the idea is that you rely on flexibility and emergent learning as opposed to relying on a long-term plan and uh, success comes from an ability to adjust and from an, ab an ability to recognize errors and shift course early so that if you do fail, you fail fast, as they say in the business world, and uh, you learn from, from your mistakes early so that you are able to, to correct course. And uh, some of Trump's appointments, such as McMaster, Tillerson, and Jim Mattis, lead me to be confident that at least Trump will have some advisors around him to steer him in the right direction. And uh, early on, we've seen a few signs, of course, there were, there were so many articles in the last few weeks of his, uh, his shifts on certain ill-advised policies, even in the first 100 days. For example, his shift on Syria, his shift on NATO, the issue of China and currency manipulation, Russia, all of these have been praised by experts across the board from liberal internationalists like Fariz Zakaria and John Nye to conservative internationalists like Paul Wolkowitz, John McKay or Elliot Abrams. And so there is there is some hope that the process might not be so screwed up as it may as it may appear from a, from a, a cursory approach. So now the issue is what would that mean for conservative foreign policy? And uh, here I would like to draw on two strands of conservative foreign policy, the conservative internationalism, 
proposed by Harry now, Paul Miller, and I think also another part, and it's too bad Colin Dua couldn't be here, but he had a great book a few years back on Hardline, in which called Hardline, which he outlined the conservative nationalist foreign policy that he argues is quite uh, quite common among Republican politicians, and uh, it, it's as he describes it, and here in Texas, uh, people would love to hear that, more like cowboy diplomacy, uh, hawkish nationalism, it comes a variety of shapes and forms, but I think that this trend of, uh, that, that Colin Duke suggests, it's actually quite different from the populist nationalist of America first, the Steve Bannon view. So I think that Trump could end up being a synthesizer of the conservative nationalist foreign policy, as Duke, Duke puts it, and the conservative internationalist one. And uh, incidentally, this idea also was stated recently by Walter Russell Mead in a Wall Street Journal op-ed, who, starting from Trump's recent comment that he's both a nationalist and a globalist, argued that uh, what we need right now is a merger of these two strands of uh, of, as Meade calls it, Jacksonian and Hamiltonian foreign policy instincts. So what would the tenets of this synthesis conservative foreign policy for the 21st century would be? And uh, I will list eight principles, six of which I believe are common between both conservative internationalists and conservative nationalists. And two of them where the two schools differ, and uh, I would argue that the best presidents manage to strike a balance in between those two extremes suggested by the two schools. I definitely take Hal's point that a lot of these issues are more of a matter of degree than difference. So politicians, of course, in practice, they they don't stick strictly to one, one direction, and none of these principles are meant to be guided as ideological straitjackets. But having said that, here, here, there. Here's how I would see a conservative, successful conservative foreign policy. And uh, for each principle, I'll also give you a sense of where I think Trump is right now, and uh, if there are any signs that he may shift in that direction. So first, there's the issue of uh, what Henry called armed diplomacy or a comfort and preference for coercive diplomacy. And that is a willingness to use a small amount of force early or show of force or threat of force in a crisis situation in order to gain leverage in negotiations rather than see force as a last resort when negotiations fail. This is a particular interpretation of Clausewitz, which is that the use of force should always relate to a political goal. And uh, this approach to linking force and diplomacy, of course, uh, reflects also Frederick the Great, great quote that diplomacy without arms is <coughs> music without instruments. And I think, actually, there are some signs that instinctively Trump may understand that thing. If you think of his bombing in Syria, for example, showing that he's not gone shy, and now the key question is, will he get any political leverage out of it? Because he definitely seemed to have gained some, the attention at least, of some uh, leaders around the world with that action. So now the key question is whether when he will use military force in small amounts early in a crisis, will he be able to move towards achieving successful political outcomes? And then, similarly, the build-up around North Korea, as haphazard as it may have looked, also gives us more leverage. And uh, as Henry mentioned earlier, it definitely drew the attention of China. And so there could be could be more of these things in the in the future. A second principle: a commitment to a military of unmatched unmatched strength. And uh, this is quite clear. In general, conservatives don't like to be second in military power. And uh, here, the administration's rhetoric was much better than their initial moves, and there's a, a great concerns that sequestration and uh, some of the other pressures that uh, Bill Brex was talking earlier from domestic spending might actually not allow Trump to raise the level of defense to the extent that uh, and hell had a great, uh, great piece recently on the military buildup we need. I think it was called 
in which he, he talks about how even a small increase in defense spending in percentage of GDP would be fundamentally affordable and needed in order for the United States to maintain this military superiority. As the US military likes to say, we don't want to be in a fair fight. We want to be in fights where we send our sons and daughters, they have the best technology and there's not even a question of, of uh, whether that's the case or not. So that's principle number two. The third principle is when the US does engage in the use of force in a more decisive way, you do not tie the hands of the military or the intelligence community in achieving their goals. And uh, here, I think, again, with the delegation of authority towards military leaders on the ground that Trump administration has been pursuing so far, and uh, with the increase of attacks in, on ISIS in Syria and in Afghanistan, I think it's shifting in that direction. Fourth, the US will show strong support for the US alliances around the world, particularly in the three core theaters of Europe, East Asia, and the Persian Gulf. And um, on this issue, I believe the administration is still quite ambiguous. The shift on NATO from being obsolete to no longer obsolete was a good sign, and uh, the administration did continue the Obama initiated deployments of US troops in Eastern Europe and deploy that to South Korea. But nevertheless, it's a, a lot more remains to be done to show that, for, for example, Trump did not yet, and I think that's one of Charlie's main points, unambiguously stated the US commitment to Article 5 of NATO. Um, so that, that's another issue. Fifth, respect for the US Constitution, US sovereignty, and for maintaining a free hand in foreign affairs, and when acting multilaterally, do so mostly with democratic allies. And hence, conservatives most often had, and that, that goes to Hell's point, I think compared to liberal internationalists, they tended to be more skeptical of universal institutions like the United Nations and of efforts of global governance in general that are based on international law that do not have a solid grounding on, on US sovereignty and national law. And uh, I, I have the, the same talking point that, that Hal mentioned about uh, the John Eikenberry idea of sacrificing some um, sovereignty in exchange for legitimacy was never quite popular. I, I think with, with conservatives, particularly as long as illiberal actors have a strong say in these universal institutions, conservatives found it troubling to, to see that as being given legitimacy from. And uh, I think, you know, Reagan, George W. Bush, uh, I think their approach to the UN will not be too different from the approach that the Trump administration will take, particularly with uh, Ambassador Hayes comments that the UN will need to change in order to better serve, uh, serve US interests. And uh, of course, when, when Harry was talking earlier about a distrust of large bureau bureaucracies, both internationally and nationally, and of large global governance projects, right now what uh, the key issue on that is the Paris Climate Accords. And uh, if you remember the presumably last inter conservative international George W. Bush withdrew from the Kyoto Accord, and uh, I don't think that it's, uh, it, even if the U.S. does not withdraw, I, I don't think that uh, the Trump administration will, uh, will invest too much in, uh, in this kind of uh, global regulation. I mean, it, it's quite clear that conservatives don't like regulations internationally any more than they like them domestically, and this administration that made that point over and over again. Six and last, both internationalists and nationalist conservatives, I argue, respect the primacy of domestic politics and uh, focus on maintaining support for foreign policy efforts when they are successful. And uh, here again, drawing on, uh, on uh, Henry's point that none of these uh, foreign policy initiatives could be long-term sustaining if they're not supported by the American people. So domestic politics always constrains the ambitions of a conservative foreign policy, perhaps even more so than, than with the other schools. And uh, 
as far as the Trump administration's action on this, you know, he's been known to check polls, so I think that he's, he's unlikely to lose track of, of some of this issue, and uh, at least in that sense, public opinion may, uh, may constrain him in terms of some of, some of his foreign policies. So in addition to these six areas of, uh, that I see this principle, the broad agreement, there are two major issues where I think the internationalist and the nationalist versions of conservative differ. And uh, I would further argue that the most successful conservative foreign policy presidents like Teddy Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan managed to find a middle way on these issues and that the current administration will need to do the same in order to be successful. And uh, first, there is the trade-off between promoting U.S. values such as democracy promotion and human rights, which are valued by conservative internationalists more so than conservative nationalists who would focus more on U.S. security and economic interests more narrowly defined. And uh, on this issue, clearly, the administration downgraded rhetorically the um, promotion of human rights, and I don't think that they talk at all about democracy promotion, whether good or bad, because you know, it's, it's not yet a concern. And uh, with the exception of Nikki Haley at the UN, there seemed to be a clear abandoning of, uh, of US values as a moral weapon against despotic regimes. So when, uh, when Ronald Reagan made his pronouncements, as we heard earlier, it wasn't just that he thought it was the right thing to do, he also thought it's very useful to do that in order to gain advantage in the Cold War. And so far, this administration does not regard that as benefiting the US in any way. And uh, the best, presumably, that could be said is that the administration did secure the release of Aya Hijazi, a former US prisoner in Egypt. And uh, they argued that perhaps more quiet diplomacy with some of these regimes may achieve more practical results. And uh, also the action in Syria certainly had a humanitarian aspect to it. So all hope is not lost on that. And I think that they, they could come closer to, to the middle position on, uh, on this issue. And lastly, there is the question of economic globalization, free trade, and the world economic order. So while all conservatives in the United States are generally in favor of free market principles, conservative internationalists are usually focusing on reducing barriers to trade both at home and abroad, and are more sanguine about the economic benefits of globalization and of advancing the world economic order through multilateral institutions and through free trade agreements. In contrast, conservative nationalists are less so, and they, prefer to, they tend to favor more mercantilist or protectionist policies and more bilateral agreements. Clearly, the Trump administration's campaign rhetoric and uh, most of their actions so far are entirely on the side of the nationalist issue on this debate. And uh, probably the best that could be said so far is that Trump did not pursue many of these campaign promises, at least in the way that, uh, that they were made. So the threat to abandon NAFTA or to impose a 35% tariff on China did not come, come to pass. And uh, to the extent that the administration will negotiate deals that will satisfy their domestic constituents, keep the public support, without starting a major trade war, that could probably be considered good enough and minimize the damage to US national interest, particularly if tax cuts and other domestic deregulations could spur economic growth and thus alleviate the economic stress that contributed to, to uh, Trump's election and to the anti-trade rhetoric in, uh, in the United States. So I'll stop there and uh, the floor to Paul. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Thank you, John. And Hal, thank you to Charlie as well. Uh, Charlie's been a great colleague, a great Harrington Fellow uh, this year, and uh, we have a great uh, professional respect and rapport. So much so that he scheduled me to be the last speaker on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm painfully aware that I'm the last uh, thing standing between you and a beautiful spring afternoon on a Friday, so I promise to take as much time as I want <laughs> to get to tell you everything I don't know. Um, well, you know, so why, uh, why are we here? Why did we spend a day talking about conservative internationalism? Um, there are very few statesmen in American history who have consciously aimed at the particular blend of ideas that we've identified as conservative internationalism. Today we've heard about 
Grover Cleveland and Teddy Roosevelt and Lloyd Eisenhower and George H.W. Bush, and it seems like none of them really fit the mold as a conservative internationalist. Each maybe exemplifies a portion or an aspect. Uh, additionally, conservative internationalism is out of power. Right? This is not a conservative internationalist uh, administration. Uh, and indeed, conservative internationalism is not only out of power in the White House, it's out of power in its own party. Uh, the Republican Party, uh, traditionally the home of conservative thought, it seems to have pretty explicitly rejected conservative internationalist thought last year when it uh, did not vote for any of the many conservative internationalist candidates, but instead elected a nationalist. And furthermore, some scholars actually doubt that something called conservative internationalism exists. Jeremy Surrey today said uh, essentially that it's really not a thing. Uh, and other scholars have said something similar. That there really is no category as conservative internationalism. Nonetheless, we spent the whole day talking about it. And, uh, and I wrote a book with conservative internationalism in the subtitle, so I better defend it. Um, uh, if there isn't such a thing as conservative internationalism, me and Henry are, are out of a job. Uh, I'm out of a job. He has tenure. Uh, but I'm out of a job. Uh, so I do think that there is such a thing as conservative internationalism. I think it's a coherent concept. Uh, I think that um, we may miss, miss it if we expect that it's a perfect historical description. Rather, I think it's an ideal type theory, right? It's an ideal type that some statesmen come closer to than others. Very few meet it exactly. I think Henry's right that Reagan and Truman and maybe Teddy Roosevelt fit it quite, quite well, and others only approximate it. Uh, so it's not quite, I think, intended to be a literal or, or very specific historical description. Um, but I think there's another way in which conservative internationalism is very much a, a real thing. Let me think for a moment on what we heard earlier today from, I think it was Josh Schiffenson, who talked about George H.W. Bush's Europe whole and free remark. And Josh said that some folks in Bush's administration thought that was a, an empty phrase. It was interesting to me that that empty phrase was entered so potent and so powerful and actually was essentially implemented over the course of the next decade. Even if the policymakers in question thought it was empty and didn't really mean much by it, isn't it illustrative that when policymakers need a phrase, empty or not, they instinctively reach for the language of classical liberalism. They instinctively reach for the language of freedom and liberty. Uh, classical liberalism is the default ideology of US political culture, both domestic and international. It's the uh, default language that statesmen relax to whenever they kind of need to describe what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that kind of rhetoric it takes on a life of its own, uh, because the American people expect it to. Uh, the American people like it. As someone else said today, realism is actually unpopular. Realism is politically unpopular. People tend not to vote for it. The American people want to be the good guys. The American people want to feel like there's a moral purpose to their nation, and to their nation's foreign policy, and to their nation's role in the world. And that expectation in a democracy translates into a pressure on policymakers to, to mimic that language and then to actually do something about it. And so that liberal, classical liberal rhetoric <coughs> entraps statesmen into actually doing classically liberal things, even if they don't believe in it, even if they're not very authentic in their, uh, or sincere in their beliefs about it, it entraps them into acting that way. Uh, so again, think about Bush's empty phrase of the Europe home free. Bill Clinton essentially implemented it. If George H.W. Bush was more of a realist, Bill Clinton was more of a liberal internationalist, neither of them was a conservative internationalist, and yet together they implemented a very conservative internationalist grand strategy over the course of the 1990s. They enhanced America's military position and power by expanding NATO, gaining allies, and hemming in Russia, and drawing a line against future Russian revanchism. But they also expanded liberty in the world's most geopolitically important region in Europe. That's conservative internationalism right there. It's the pursuit of power and the pursuit of liberty. And Bush and Clinton together did it, even though neither one of them consciously articulated that way, or, or perhaps even intended to, but that's what they ended up actually doing. I think that may be an example of how conservative internationalism is far more common in American history than we tend to see. I think, to put it this way, conservative internationalism is the default unarticulated, instinctive grand strategy of the United States since its emergence as a great power 130 years ago. 
default, unarticulated, instinctive. Very few statesmen actually say this. Very few statesmen, Reagan I think is the best example, but very few others say it quite the way that Reagan did, or Truman, uh, that they're out to enhance American power and use it in the service of liberal ideals. But that's effectively what we do. Uh, conservative internationalism is the mean to which we regress after we oscillate from one extreme to the other. It's the mean between those two extremes. And as we kind of oscillate back and forth, we regress to that mean. We have a Wilsonian moment, we pursue ideals, we feel idealistic, and then we get chastened and realize the pitfalls and dangers of idealism. We get a dose of pragmatism and we start tacking back towards a more realistic stance, so passing through conservative internationalism. And then we, we enjoy a realist moment where we maybe trim our sails, hedge our bets, and uh, uh, lower our moral ambitions. But then we start to realize the pitfalls of that realism. We realize the pitfalls of the cynicism, the amorality of that, and we start to rediscover our idealism, and we tack back again. And in the swinging back and forth, we end up implementing, on average, over the long haul, a conservative internationalist grand strategy. Again, over the long haul, unarticulated, we actually do this. Uh, uh, grand strategy is partly the intellectual architecture that gives form and substance to American foreign policy, but it's also the long-term pattern of behavior. If you look at the long-term pattern of behavior, we pursue power, we pursue liberal ideals. And that's the best shorthand definition I can think of for conservative internationalism, power and liberty together. Uh, so where does that leave us uh, now? Right. And by the way, that's why I think it's worth spending a day thinking about conservative internationalism. I think it's far more prevalent in American history than we give it credit for. And I think it's a real thing. And I think we're probably going to end up returning to it time and time again in the future. So this was a worthwhile conference, Trevor. Right. Um, where are we now? You know, obviously, conservative internationalism is out of power. Uh, the American people uh, are not in an internationalist mood. They've elected a nationalist government. I think, I think for the first time since 18, was it 20, 32. Uh, that we have a really truly nationalist uh, administration. Uh, that doesn't mean conservative internationalism is entirely on the sidelines. I think Yonet is, is correct that there's some real overlap between nationalism and conservative internationalism. I agree that at the overlap are the ideas of armed diplomacy, uh, military strength, not tying the hands of the military, playing to the win, essentially. And so that's why I can look at the first 100 days of the Trump administration, the nationalist administration, not conservative internationalist by any measure, and yet I can look at the way they've handled the North Korea situation and say that's actually, I think it makes a lot of sense. They are doing a lot of saber rattling. Uh, it's a lot of coercive diplomacy, or an attempt at coercive diplomacy. And uh, up until the war, if there is one, and maybe even through the war with North Korea, it will, it will be something that conservative internationalists can probably agree with. It's what happens after the war where we'll see a stark departure, right? In the nationalist, or now I'm going to use Walter Leeds' language, in the Jacksonian tradition, you fight the war, you win the war, you go home. And I suspect that maybe what happens with the Trump administration, we're going to fight the war, we're going to win the war, we're going to go home. Uh, and a conservative nationalist would actually fight the war, win the war, and stay, to, out of recognition of the opportunity, uh, and the importance, not, the, not just the opportunity, but the importance and the almost necessity of staying to uh, rebuild and to, and to spread American influence and American ideals in a, in a geostrategic, uh, strategically important region of the world, East Asia. So that's where we'll see some departure. Let me, let me reflect on a few other uh, differences between conservative internationalism and nationalism. I think Yolanda did a great job talking about the overlap. Let me talk about some of the differences where I see some, uh, some departure. And this is going to be, I'm going to reflect on the nationalist rhetoric of the Trump administration, not just going to be the campaign rhetoric, uh, because I don't know how they're going to govern. We've only got 100 days to go on, and it's really hard, it's really hard to prognosticate about the future direction of the Trump administration. Just don't know what we're going to get every day. Uh, but uh, if the goal of a conservative internationalist grand strategy is to increase freedom in the world, I don't think that's the goal of a nationalist or a Jacksonian administration. Their goal uh, isn't to worry about liberal order and the outer perimeter of American security. I think it's a good way of describing liberal order as the outer perimeter of American security. I think that Jacksonians spend more time worrying about the inner perimeter, about American sovereignty, about American identity, about American physical security and territory, and territorial integrity. Uh, Jacksonians don't worry about that outer perimeter. That does mean, I think that Jacksonians tend to be more spend more of their energy uh, on domestic issues, and they approach domestic issues differently. Conservative nationalists definitely have a domestic policy, but they approach it from a different direction. So take immigration, for example. I think when the Jacksonian approaches immigration, 
to them, that issue is, is mostly about two things. It's mostly about the um, economic impact of immigration on the American working class. Jacksonianism is mostly a phenomenon of the working class of, of middle America. And it's about uh, a cultural assimilation. Jacksonians tend to be a bit more pessimistic about the possibility of assimilating large uh, numbers of immigrants. But a conservative internationalist looks at the issue of immigration and is a little bit more optimistic about cultural assimilation because of a different attitude towards American ideals. And I'll talk a bit more about American exceptionalism here in a minute. I think a, a conservative internationalists are a bit more optimistic about the universalizability of American ideals, and therefore it, it's spreadable beyond our shores, but it's also spreadable to our own immigrants. And those who come to our shores, uh, I think conservative internationalists worry a little bit less about how well they're going to, uh, to assimilate, because frankly, over two centuries, immigrants always do assimilate. You know, there's a good track record there to go on. Uh, and uh, again, conservative internationalists uh, like more optimistic. Not quite as optimistic as liberal internationalists. I, I think we would look at liberal internationalists and say, yeah, you're maybe a little bit too naive about the ease of the spread of universal ideals. It is kind of hard, it takes effort, uh, but more optimistic than Jacksonians. On trade, Jacksonians look at trade, again, as a function of social policy. Um, are there going to be enough jobs for Americans? Uh, and what is the distribution of income created by different trade policies? Conservative internationalists look at trade policy not as a function of social policy, but as a, as a function of strategic influence and, and, and prosperity. F free trade spread open, enlarges the pie. We want free trade because we want to get richer. But also, free trade tends to open up doors of influence by the United States to other countries. And so, the TPP, for example, Trump threw it out. A conservative internationalist, I think, would have really pursued the TPP uh, hard as a measure of economic influence in East Asia as a way to pry other countries away from China's economic orbit. That is a very stark difference between nationalists and conservative internationalists. And finally, I think most importantly, uh, American exceptionalism. I think, this is a, I think this is the issue that really divides the nationalists from the internationalists. Uh, Jacksonians believe America's great, and it's going to stay that way, and it's great because, because of who we are, and because of where we are, and maybe it, because of our act, ideals, but Jacksonians tend not to believe those ideals that are very spreadable. And if it's spreadable, it's not really our business to spread them. Conservative internationalists believe, on the other hand, that American ideals, that America's great, it's a great, in large part, because of our ideals, and those ideals are great because they're universalizable, and they can be spread, and so it is America's role to champion, to, to cheerlead, to foster, uh, uh, no, not to force at the point of gun, we all know that, but to uh, champion such ideals. Um, that, I think, is the biggest difference between the nationalists and the internationalists. You look at Secretary of State Tillerson's speech just the other day. Uh, he, he gave kind of a tour of the horizon, but he made a few remarks. He said, um, if you condition our national security efforts on someone adopting our values, we probably can't achieve our national security goals. If we condition too heavily that others must adopt this value that we've come to, it creates an obstacle to our ability to advance our national security interests. Uh, and he very clearly prioritized our, our security and our economic interests, and then said, when we can, we can also spread our values. Uh, looking at that rhetoric, if I just was looking at the plain words on the paper, I think I might agree, of course, physical security is most important, and, and ideals, you, you know, maybe kind of have to prioritize that way. But you don't say that out loud, right? You don't actually admit this when you're the Secretary of State. I think a conservative internationalist would understand, rhetorically, you're always on the side of liberty, of freedom, of human rights, uh, and of freedom in the world. Um, it, 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 essentially, Tillerson's cutting a bad deal. He's announcing in advance what his bottom line is, what his negotiating posture is. He's telling everybody in advance, I don't care that much about human rights, which really hampers his ability to negotiate and bargain hard for the spread of freedom in the world when it comes down to it. Conservatives often criticize President Obama for his announced withdrawal deadlines from Iraq and Afghanistan, his pre-announced withdrawals. I, I was part of that. I, I totally agree that was a bad move to announce those withdrawals in advance. But here, Tillerson is essentially announcing our withdrawal in advance from the, from the negotiating position of pushing hard for uh, liberty around the world. And that's going to undercut his negotiating leverage over the next four to eight years. Uh, so conservative internationalists would not have given that speech. That is a very nationalist, a very American first speech to give. Let me conclude briefly with maybe a prediction. Uh, since I'm not a historian, I'm a political scientist, I can predict. Um, what are we likely to see in a nationalist era? 
Well, I think uh, if, uh, uh, in the nationalist era, I think it does make military action more likely. Uh, I think the Trump administration has always shown us willingness to rattle the saber and use military force that might be that might be appropriate in some cases, but uh, pro or con, I think it's more likely. Uh, but I also think the aftermath of any such war is unlikely to go well. I think this administration is intellectually poorly disposed to handle the aftermath of a, of a, of a, of a military action. Um, I think trade protectionism is probably going to make us all poor. Um, I think the nationalist rhetoric uh, will be unhelpful for uh, uh, divisions at home. Right. Internationalist rhetoric or cosmopolitan rhetoric at least emphasizes what we hold in common rather than what divides us. Uh, for the same reason, internationally, nationalist rhetoric could end up eroding American soft power and eroding American leadership. The positive sign is, because of all these bad things, the pendulum will swing again. If, if the legacy of the Bush years was, uh, was the Obama and now Trump kind of era of retrenchment and restraint, I think that the legacy of the Trump era will be a rediscovery of the virtues of internationalism. I think after this era, however long it lasts, we're going to see internationalism revive in both its liberal and conservative variants, and we will once again, however long it takes, in eight years and ten years, we will once again see a crop of statesmen willing to make the argument uh, that America's interests around the world have to be pursued in and with our partners around the world. Thank you. Um, this is a panel about the 21st century, so I'd like to prod you to talk a little bit more about the future. Now, I left off my section about the 22nd century. Okay, that's <laughs> appropriate for a very. Um, and in order to think about the future, I naturally decided to look towards the past. And what occurred to me in reading about armed diplomacy was um, a quote by the strategist Thucydides, who in the 5th century BC, um, in writing about going to war, said that it is a common mistake in going to war to begin at the wrong end, to act first and wait for, dis uh, wait for disasters to discuss the matter. So he's here making a comment about the relation, the proper relation between diplomacy and negotiation and the use of armed force. So I'd like to ask you your views on what you think is that proper relation between negotiation and diplomacy and the use of armed force. It occurs to me that that's something that's animated our conversations throughout the day. And in looking forward into the, the next several decades, um, can that proper relation emerge in American grand strategy? Should it? Um, conservative internationalism, of course, offers one view of what that relationship between force and negotiation should look like, which is that they should be concurrent. Um, or is it something else that will emerge in the state of nationalism we have now? I'll start. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I generally agree with the proposition that the Henry and others have made for the day that diplomacy tends to work a lot better when you have a credible military option that is seen to be uh, actually considered. And, and so thinking about George W. Bush, I, I do agree that one of the great mistakes was to delay the onset of diplomacy with Iran by, depending on how you're measuring, a year to three years after the invasion of Iraq, thereby dissipating all of the leverage that you had from the, the really astonishing success of the initial invasion. And so by the time you actually got into it in 2006, you were bogged down and the Iranians knew it and they were bleeding you in Iraq, and so there was very little leverage. I think that the issue, though, is that, and this is maybe we're all against the present, or at least the future, you know, doing this well takes a lot of skill. Right? I mean, you actually have to think hard about how you're going to synchronize uh, both military pressures and other coercive pressures and then diplomatic outreach. And, and, and this is why I'm so concerned about the Trump administration. I think they get that you have to have a stick in order to make the carrot attractive. So I fundamentally agree with that part of the Korea strategy. But I think you know, on North Korea in particular, there are two problems, one of which isn't their fault and one of which is. One is that the stick just isn't credible. I mean, if there was a credible military option with North Korea, we would have used it in 1994. There's not today for the same reason, reason there hasn't been for two and a half decades. And it has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. It has to do with artillery tubes and 30 million people living in Seoul. Uh, and so there's just limited leverage that they're going to get out of that because 
after a few weeks, the Chinese and other and the North Koreans are going to realize that this administration isn't actually any more eager for a war, for good reason than the last administration. So that, that one's not their fault. The one that is their fault is that I just don't think this president is uh, temperamentally or intellectually capable of maintaining sort of the balance and the calibration you need to carry out effective course of diplomacy. He's been all over the map uh, just over the past few weeks. And so you, you can make the argument that this is actually going to pay dividends because it's going to, I don't say this in a pejorative term, it's going to convince everybody that we're crazy. And so you've got to really look out for what we're going to do. But again, that, that game is only going to work for a limited amount of time. And after that, you're going to be right back where you are. But, but in the meantime, you may very well have influenced South Korean politics in negative ways by really freaking them out and offending them over that. Uh, and and you, run, you run the risk of ramping up tensions to a point that could be dangerous. And so I, I think that they have kind of perhaps the right principle in mind, but I'm very skeptical of whether they'll be able to execute. Yeah, the, the madman strategy only works if you're faking it. <laughs> yeah. um, arm diplomacy is a, a hard and, and, and delicate thing where you're, where you're you know, using the dials of diplomacy and, and, milita and military uh, instrument uh, in a very calibrated way. And any administration would have a hard time doing that. Uh, having worked in the U.S. federal government for 10 years, I tell you, it's massively difficult to do something in a finely calibrated way. Uh, bureaucracy often is not that responsive to, to do fine-tuned adjustments, and I think the Trump administration has some unique challenges on top of that. Yeah, I would agree. The only thing I would also bring up would be that it's very important that you have clear political objectives, and I think if we were to achieve, for example, with, with North Korea, some sort of understanding between us and the Chinese and the South Koreans of where we would like this to end up. Is it denuclearized Korea? Is it some other form of reunification? Then at least you'd be able to, to begin fine-tuning all of this. But So that's why I think, beginning with what you said, first you need clear political goals that you're willing to commit for a little while, at least to see if it works, that you may have to change the goals eventually if, if it doesn't work. But you definitely don't want to start with both shifting political views and shifting military means and see where, where it goes. Great, thank you.